Good morning, everyone. Boy, my voice sounds a little tired. I was singing in the car on the way over here this morning. Just kidding, I wasn't. Too much talking this morning. Well, as John uh, mentioned, my name is Rich Cortez. I'm one of the pastors here. It's good to have you uh, worshiping with us this morning. If this is your first time to Cornerstone, we're really glad that you're here today. Um, thank you for joining us. If you're watching online, whether this is your first time or not, we're glad that you're participating with us as well. We want to encourage you to participate, so use the chat. Let us know you're there. Give some amens or oh me's or oh my's, and uh, that's good advice for everyone. I preach much better uh, when there are lots of amens. I also preach longer when there are lots of amens. All right, all right, that's good. We're going to, all right. Uh, we're in 1 Peter, if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 7, we're going to go through verse 11, and while you're turning there, and we'll have the verses up on the screen, but uh, uh, while you're turning there, let me just reiterate a couple things, again, grow track today at 1 o'clock, step two in the conference room, love to have you be a part of that. If you've been attending Cornerstone, but you haven't been through growth track, please join us. It's a great way to find out more about the church and how to get involved in all of that stuff. So I'd uh, love to have you join us. And then, of course, I want to mention our serve day coming up this Saturday, July 17th. Um, we'd love to have you participate in that as well. We have a number of great projects. We're going to be helping a couple of schools here in Cheshire, the police department. Uh, we're going to be helping Acts 4, a ministry in Waterbury that uh, just serves the greater Waterbury area. And so we need people who can plant, who can paint, who can push a broom, organize stuff. Uh, Acts 4 can use 20 people. So we'll send 20 people over there if we get, get the help. And uh, they have all kinds of things that need to be done there. So you, if you have some skill, that's great. If you have no skill, that's great, too. Love to have you be a part of that and just come out and, and join us. That's uh, this Saturday. It goes from 8 a.m. to about noon. That's about the time you should uh, plan for. And um, I'd love to have you, again, participate. There's a table in the foyer. Stop by. Uh, you can sign up there if you're watching online, or if you would rather register online, you could do that. Go to our website, cornerstonecheshire.com, and uh, just find the uh, serve day link, and uh, you can register uh, that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 7. This is what God's word says. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another, Without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you today again for your, your goodness and grace, your love for us, a love we don't deserve, but you give so freely. We thank you for your word. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, an infallible guide. So speak to our hearts, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. I like funerals. I know that may sound a little strange, maybe even a bit morbid, but uh, funerals have a way of impacting my life, even reorienting my life. Had the uh, honor and the privilege to both uh, attend and participate in the memorial service of James Augustus Mahan, the father of Kevin. Mahan, who attends church here. Uh, many of you know Kevin if you've been involved in our men's group, attended our morning men's group. Kevin is the leader there. Uh, again, if you've attended church here on practically any Sunday, you have probably said hello to Kevin. Kevin has been involved in our usher ministry for many, many years, was the leader of that ministry for a number of years. And so Kevin is uh, here almost every service uh, at one of the doors somewhere greeting and seating folks. And so you've probably bumped into him. His wife, Janine, works here at the church. 
she is here almost every Sunday as well. And so I'm sure if you've ever called the church and uh, needed some information, you've probably spoken to Janine. If you've walked through the doors on a Sunday morning, you've probably run into Janine and have seen her and probably said hi to her or whatever. Well, Kevin's dad passed away a week ago Friday. And then this past Friday, uh, they had the memorial service for him, and I was blown away. Uh, James lived an extraordinary life. And as I sat there and I listened to his kids talk about uh, the love and appreciation they had for their dad, as I listened to the grandkids with tears just talk about the impact that Pappy had on their life, I was blown away. They talked about his, his generosity. They talked about walks around Gray Pond. They talked about vacations on Cape Cod and Christmas and Thanksgiving and cookouts. And James had an impact on their lives. They talked about his legacy. And as I sat there and I listened, I was blown away and I was convicted, really. I, I, I was saying to myself, what am I doing with my life? At the end of the memorial service, I uh, called uh, my wife Nadine to tell her I was on the way home just in case I got lost. Someone would know that I was out there, you know. And uh, she said, how did it go? And uh, I said, we need to talk. Man, I, you know, I need to spend time with the kids, with my grandkids. Yep, I have grandkids. I have two and one on the way. I know you're going to be thinking about that for the rest of the service. You can't believe that I have grandkids as young as I am. Uh, try to get past that and move on. Uh, forget about that, you know. Uh, but I do have two grandkids, one on the way. And as I was thinking just about Pappy, about James and his life and the impact he had on his kids and his family, uh, I just was touched and, and challenged to live my life to the full. Peter's kind of doing the same thing in our text, isn't he? You know, he starts off in verse 7 by saying, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, right? And then last week, Pastor Eric talked about a lot of those things, didn't he? Love one another. Live sober-mindedly, right? All of these things that flow out of living in light of the reality that Jesus is coming back. The kingdom is going to happen, right? That's, that's what Peter's getting at here. The end of all things, right? History is moving toward its appointed end and its destiny. And Peter says, man, we ought to live our lives. In fact, he's asking the question, how should we live our lives in light of that reality? The apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13 does the same thing. Listen to what Paul says. He says, besides this, as he writes to this church in Rome, he says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Think of that imagery. You know, the Apostle Paul is talking about the night is almost over, right? The darkness of sin and its influence and presence in this world is coming to an end. And the day is at hand. The, the day of God's kingdom, even the day of his judgment is coming. And it's going to come into this world. And those who believe in Christ will, will share in, in an eternity where it gets better and better and better, right? To use uh, the language of C.S. Lewis, right? C.S. Lewis uses that in the Chronicles of Narnia where he talks about the winter, right? And, and the cold and, and how in that movie, right? The, the cold was giving way to, to light and sun and warmth, right? He's, he's talking about the kingdom of God. And that reality is coming. It came with Jesus, Jesus announced, right, his ministry. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said that again and again. It's near. It's breaking into this world in who he was. 
Luke in the book of Acts talks about how in the last days God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Talking about those final moments. We've been living in the last days. We as believers, those of us who are believers in Christ, who have put their trust in him, who believe in him and follow him, right? We're end time people. We're last days people. That's what Marxists and, and Peter and Paul are, are reminding us of that reality. And they are saying essentially, since Christ is going to return, how should you then live your life? And then, of course, Peter tells us, right, love, show hospitality, right, live sober-mindedly. And what I want to do is zero in on one thing that Peter says here in our text this morning. Peter says, in addition to the things that Pastor Eric covered last week, and he even touched on this one, I just kind of want to zoom in on, right, maybe like a call out and just kind of zero on it. Peter says here that in light of Jesus' return, in light of the coming kingdom, you and I should live our lives in service to others. In light of Jesus' return, Peter says that you and I should live our lives in service to other people. Now, Peter says three things about that, and I want to talk about those three things for a few moments with you. First of all, Peter says, let me get there. That everyone has something to contribute when it comes to serving others. Everyone has something to contribute, something to give that they've received, that they're to give in service to other people. Listen to what the text says here. Verse 10, right? As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Now that may sound a little uncertain, right? Peter's not at all uncertain, Peter is actually making a statement here. He's not really saying, you know, if you have a gift, then use it. Peter's saying, you have a gift, now use it, right? He's affirming that reality. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're someone who has surrendered your life to Christ, you say, I follow Jesus, I believe in him. I think he is the ruler of the kings of the earth and I've put my trust in him. You have a gift that he has given you to serve other people. It's not some talent that you've developed over the course of your life. It's a gift, a gift of God's grace. I knew a girl when I was growing up, man, she could blow air out of her eyeball. We're not talking about something weird like that. Not something that's going to land you on America's Got Talent, right? We're talking about a gift of God's grace, something that God has put in you, that he gave to you. And the purpose of that, one of the purposes, is that you are to use that gift to serve other people. Peter, again, is saying that in light of Christ's return, in light of that coming kingdom, you know, we're to live our lives in service to others. And everyone, everyone who's a believer has something to contribute. The Apostle Paul makes the same kind of statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he talks about gifts of the Holy Spirit, where he talks about the church as the body of Christ. Listen to what he says. He says, now there are variety, varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in all in everyone to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then again in verse 11 of that same chapter, he goes into a whole list of different kinds of gifts of the Spirit, manifestations of the Spirit. And he says in verse 11, all these are empowered by, the, by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. What Paul is saying there is that God puts gifts in people as he determines and he places those people in a local congregation to be used to build that congregation up, to strengthen that congregation so that that congregation can, can grow and flourish and fulfill its mission of making disciples and fulfill its mission in the place where it is planted. 
And everyone, Paul and Peter agree, everyone has something to contribute. That's what they mean when they say each one. Each one has a gift. Each one has something to contribute. By some reckoning in the Bible, there are uh, about 23 spiritual gifts that are mentioned. They go all the way back to the Old Testament. We can see some places where God enables people by the Spirit to have abilities to use for the building of the tabernacle. You see, uh, again, uh, various lists in the New Testament in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in 1 Peter. You have all these lists. And, and by some accounting, uh, there are 23 of them listed. And I think most scholars agree that those lists are not exhaustive. And so again, the point being made is that everyone has something to contribute for the common good so that the church will be strengthened, so that it can flourish and grow, grow in numbers, but more importantly, grow in its love, grow deeper in its love for one another, deeper in its love for the communities in which the church finds itself, deeper in its knowledge and understanding of God and who he is. And everyone has something to contribute toward that end. So that's the first thing that Peter says. Everybody has something, right? He reminds us, again, we're living in light of the fact that the kingdom of God is near. The end of all things is at hand. And if Peter said that nearly 2,000 years ago, you can be sure that it is close to us now. And Peter says in light of that reality, he's saying live in light of that reality, Keep that in your mind. And as you do, right, remember that living in light of the reality of Christ's return means that we should live our lives in service to others. And again, everybody has something to contribute toward that end. Secondly, Peter says we should steward that gift or those gifts, right? We should manage them. We should steward them. Again, listen to what he says in the text. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. As, as stewards of God's diverse grace, right? He's, Peter is calling on us here to think about the gifts that God has given to us and manage them, budget them in a way in relation to the other things that are in our lives. You know what a budget is, right? I hope you have a budget, uh, even if it's on a napkin or an envelope somewhere that you got tucked away that you can pull out and say, all right, this is how much money I make, and here's all my expenses. And what you do in a budget, right, is you look at your income, and then you look at your expenses, and hopefully you have more income than expenses, right? But if you don't, then you got to stop and rethink things, right? Right? If you're spending more than you take in, you either need to get a second job or you got to cut some stuff loose, right? And Peter's kind of saying the same thing here. You know, budgets help us to prioritize. Where should we spend our money? We do that with time. How should we spend our time? Well, Peter's saying here, God has given you a gift. He's given you grace, some grace in your life that he has given you. And he wants you to manage that, steward that in relation to the other things that are in your life, like family or work or yourself, your health. A number of years ago, um, Nadine and I and a team of people from Calvary Christian Church uh, started a, a new church. We planted a church in Beverly, Massachusetts in September of 2008, Garden City Church. And uh, as we were preparing to plant that church, uh, my daughter, in January of 2008, uh, was diagnosed with leukemia for the second time. And so as we got that news, we had to hit the brakes, hit the pause button, stop and say, all right, hold on a second. 
Can we continue to move forward with all that's going on in our lives, all that's going to happen? We had to sit down with our leadership and talk with them and pray with them. We had to pray ourselves. We had to pray with the team that was starting to come together. People had said, we're going to go. We're going to do. We had to work through all those issues. We had to steward the gifts and the things that God was doing in our lives in relationship to what was going on in our family. And of course, you already know, we planted that church. We did do it that year. Well, with the help of so many people, we would not have made it without them. But of course, that also, right, limited Nadine's involvement. It limited my involvement in that church because of things that were going on at home in our family. And so Peter's saying that's what we need to do. We need to think about the gifts, right, the grace that God has given us, and steward that, manage that, budget it in relation to the other things in our lives. Sometimes work will keep you from serving in the way that you want to or maybe in the way that is best for you, right? Your job may require you to do a lot of travel at this time, and so you have to think about, how do I do that? How do I serve you, Lord? How do I use what you've given me to serve certainly my church, but others and be a part of that community that is trying to reach others with this good news. How do I do that in light of my job and what it's demanding of me right now? How do I do that when I have health issues and it seems almost impossible to serve? How can I get involved and serve if I got health issues that limit my ability to be Involved. Did you guys forget to say amen? Because, that, you know, it helped me preach a little better, you know. You see y'all looking at me there. Right? We, we got to manage things. We got to steward th things. We, we have a budget. Listen, am I using my gift too much? That's a reality. Right? I, may, I meet people. Uh, we have people at this church, man, they'll serve all three services every Sunday of every week of the year. Uh, that's probably not the best thing. In fact, we don't encourage that. Uh, we want you to attend service, be able to come to church on Sunday and not have to work. <laughs> amen. That's a good spot for an amen, right? To come and, and be a part of that. But, you know, am I using it too much? That's a, that's a recipe for burnout, right? Peter Scazzaro uh, used to pastor on in uh, uh, Long uh, not in Long Island, in Queens, New York, and you know, he said that's what happens. He sees a lot of leaders burn out because they're doing for Jesus isn't the same as their being with Jesus. And so they are giving, right? They're over committed, over budgeted, and they burn out. We need to steward the gift and the grace that God gives us. But listen, all of those things, family and health and work, those have to be seasonal kinds of things. If that is pulling you out in a permanent kind of way, I think we have to, again, reevaluate those things. Take a look at it and say, Lord, is this what you have for me? I'm so limited. Listen, I believe that work is important. Certainly family is crucial. But again, we have to budget and manage our gifts and the grace that God has given us in light of those realities and make adjustments where needed. So Peter tells us here in our text, right, that in light of Christ's return and his coming, we should give ourselves in service to others. And everybody has something to contribute. We need to manage those things in a way, in, in relation to the other things in our lives. And in fact, I think Jesus, in the parable of the talents, pushes us in that very direction. And in Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus tells this parable about the talents. Now, many of you probably know that parable, that story. Uh, I would point out to you the context there uh, is... Christ's return, right? In chapter 24, that's the question. That's the issue that service, uh, surfaces. And then Jesus gives a pretty lengthy discourse on his return and what it's going to be like and urges believers in that reality to be prepared for his return. And in Matthew chapter 25, where that discourse continues, Jesus says this, beginning in verse 14, for it, meaning my return, 
will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Now, many of us know the rest of that story. Right, the guy with the five talents, he comes back, he calls them to account, and he's made another five talents. And he says, here, uh, you gave me five, I've gained five more. Same with the guy with the two talents, right? He, he's got two. He said, you gave me two. I've gained two more. Here are the two talents plus two more. The guy with the one, what did he do? He was afraid, takes a talent, stuffs it in the ground, and uh, it didn't go well for him. When Jesus calls him to account, he says, you wicked and lazy servant. Right? Jesus is teaching us, you know, that we, we have been given grace and there is some uh, responsibility on our part to use those gifts in a way that multiplies, that has impact, that brings growth, that brings change to people's lives for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. So we learn in that. And again, Peter is reminding us of that reality, that one day Jesus is going to return and we're going to give an account for the grace and the gifts that he's given to us. And have we lived in light of that return using what we have for him? So once again, Peter is reminding us that in light of Christ's return, we are to live our lives in service to other people. That's one of the major things he says in our text this morning. In fact, it gets most of the attention in those uh, four or five verses that we read. And he reminds us that every single one of us have something to contribute and that we need to manage what he's given us in light of the other things that he has given us as well. And then thirdly, uh, Peter tells us here uh, that we should use whatever gifts, whatever grace God has given to us to bring him glory. Listen to what he says in our text. As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And listen to what he says here, because this is part of the stewardship. He says, whoever speaks, whoever is a speaking gift, he should do it as one who speaks oracles of God. The person should speak boldly as if they've been sent and commissioned by God to speak. Whoever serves should serve as one who is serving by the strength that God supplies. And then notice here, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter breaks out into praise. Amen. Now, Peter's reminding us here that the ultimate purpose and aim for the gifts and the grace that God has given you and me, given to us as as his followers, right, is for the purpose of bringing him glory. He says the, the, the very reason, the very purpose that he put those gifts in you is to bring him glory. He's done that as he sees fit. He's done that as he, as he wills in his infinite wisdom and love and grace. He's put those things in you so that you will bring him glory. Through Jesus Christ. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 nearly says the same thing. Again, you can see the teaching of Jesus uh, being, uh, you know, I guess bleeding through what Peter is writing here, right? Uh, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Think about what Jesus is saying here. In a city that sits on the top of a hill can't be hidden. Its light is evident. Right? You know, the, the reason that God puts gifts in you and gives you grace It's to be seen, 
not for yourself, but for his glory. Lamps are not designed to be put under a table, but in a place that can bring light to everyone. The same thing. God has given you gifts. He's put grace into your life so that you can serve him in a way that brings him glory. Peter says, in light of Christ's return, we should live lives in service to others. Each one of us has been given some gift, some grace. What an amazing thought, right? God has put grace in you and me to serve him. He's given us something to serve others. And we need to steward that in relationship to the other things that God has brought into our lives. And we're to do it in a way that brings him glory. So why don't we serve? Well, there are a few reasons. In, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you all those reasons. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let me just mention a couple of them. Why don't we serve? Well, sometimes people don't serve because they don't know what their gift or what that grace is that God has given them, right? We just don't know what it is, and so we're, we're not really serving. Well, it just so happens that today... At 1 o'clock, in the conference room, Growth Track Step 2 covers that. What a shameless plug, wasn't that? <laughs> oh, seriously, I mean, it, that, that's what's happening today. Step 2, we cover that. You know, in Step 2, we make an effort to help people discover their design. That's what we call it, discover their design. Again, we have an assessment. You can go through some things to try to figure out, what is my spiritual gift? All we're trying to do there is help you to see over the course of your life, are there things, are there signs, is there any uh, evidence, you know, that God has been working in your life in a way that shows maybe a gifting there? You know, that, that love of hospitality, that may not just be something that you've developed over the course of life. Maybe it's something God has put into your life by his designing grace to build others up help his church grow, right? So in step two, we do that. We try to help people identify their gift. That's not all we do. We help you identify, you know, your gift, but we also talk a little bit about your, your personality, about the way that you're wired, the way that God designed you. Maybe you like things structured or maybe not, right? You know, how does that help you to know where you serve? Or uh, we look at things like, uh, ministry passion. Do you have a passion? What keeps you up at night? What makes you angry? Maybe that's an indication of where you should serve. Is it kids? Is it youth? Is it worship? Whatever that, you know, and we try to help you navigate some of that so that you can, you know, discover your design, see what God is doing at work in your life to help you find a, a place of ministry that will be fruitful and fulfilling. You'll make a kingdom difference. And when you're using your gift and I'm using my gift, that's what happens. The church is strengthened. It fulfills its mission in the world, makes an impact. And in the end, God gets the glory through Jesus Christ. You know, we help you to put together kind of a ministry profile, if you will, to help you find that place to serve. And again, today, one o'clock, step two. If you can't do it today, you can sign up and jump in on Grow Track anytime, and it'll come around, and you'll be able to, to get that done. So, so people, that's one reason why people don't serve, is because they don't know their gifts. Gifts. Uh, number two, they don't do it because of fear. They're afraid. Like the guy in the story, they're afraid of, you know, may, what if I mess up? You know, God's going to squash me, or what if I say the wrong thing, or what if people don't accept me, or all those kinds of things, right? And we're afraid, and again, you would be in good company there's a whole Bible full of people who were often afraid to step out and do what God was calling them to do. Moses would be at the top of that list. He was afraid. He said, I can't speak. What if they don't believe me? He had a whole list of reasons why he didn't want to go back to Egypt, right? And God said, listen, I'll be with you. And that's the reality. God has put those gifts. He's given you that grace so that you can serve him and you can 
Glorify him. So do it. Don't be afraid. Yeah, you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. I did in both of the services prior to this one. First service, forgot to mention the offering stuff, even though it's right there on the back wall. So, you know, I miss it. And again, tomorrow I'll go through and I'll say, oh, I forgot to say that or I forgot to do this or, you know. Again, that happens, but that's part of growing. And so we just got to be willing to give ourselves and step out and let God use us. A third and final reason why people often don't serve comes down to just straight up disobedience. Some people, maybe some of you, have just been resisting God. You're just, you're not doing it. Whatever it is, might be something selfish. You just like having weekends. You don't want to get involved. You don't want commitment. Could be a host of reasons. Could be something going on in your personal life, the way that you're living. You know, hey, I'm not, I'm not living right for God right now, and I can't, I can't serve in the way, right? And the only, the, the answer to that, the solution to that one is to, uh, to really just repent and, and say, God, forgive me, help me. I, I need to serve you. I realize that you're coming, and one day I'm going to have to give an account for my life. I'm going to stand before you. And so the call for you is, is to repent and Turn back to God and let him to be, begin to use you. You know, maybe for both of those who are, you know, a little fearful and disobedient, another shameless plug, uh, we do have serve day coming up. It's a great way to break the ice, right? You can go ahead, sign up for something there, man. If you haven't been serving, it's a great opportunity to just get out and experience it, get connected, maybe meet some people and say, you know what? I don't know why I've been afraid. This is awesome, you know, and I love it. And so I, I would encourage you, uh, to do that. Again, Peter is reminding us in our text that in light of Christ's return, you and I ought to live our lives in service to others. And every single one of us who calls Jesus Lord has some grace that he's given for that purpose. And we should steward that. In light of the, the other realities, the other things that God has put into our lives, family and work and health, and we should use those gifts in a way to glorify God through Jesus Christ. I mentioned that in uh, September of 2008, uh, we planted a church, Garden City Church in Beverly, Massachusetts. And uh, as we were leading up to that plant prior to January of 2008, uh, was um, 2007, it was Halloween, October 31st, uh, family, we were all around, I don't know, we were probably uh, eating candy, I don't know what we were doing, it was Halloween night, and uh, my daughter, who was nine at the time, said, like it was like a discovery, we're planting a church, we're leaving Calvary, the church that we were at, I said, yeah. She was like, I'm not leaving. She didn't want to go. She loved that church. She was nine years old. I said, you're nine. You're going. You don't have a choice. Uh, she said, when I'm 18, I'm going to go back to Calvary. I said, fine. I got nine years to change your mind. You know, you're going to stick it out with us, right? You know, but yeah, nine years old. She said, I'm not going. And she was upset and she went upstairs to her room, and then she wrote out this lengthy list of all of the reasons why she didn't want to go on the church plant. Now, her mother being far more spiritual than I am, and that is very true. <laughs> uh, how come you're not laughing at that? Because <laughs> you know that's true, too. <laughs> My Tuesday night group knows that's true. They know how unspiritual I am, actually. You know. Nadine, again, being far more spiritual than I am, goes up to her room and says, Tori, honey, I know you're upset and, you know, you're disappointed. And she said, listen, let's take this list that you've written out and let's pray over it. You know, God knows best. He knows what to do with our lives. He knows he's got good plans for us. So let's just take that list and let's just pray over it and give it to God. And so they did that. They prayed and gave it to God. Well, the next morning... Uh, Tori gets up, goes down for breakfast. Her and Nadine are having breakfast together. And uh, we were going through this uh, book uh, with our family for devotional time. We did it in the morning. It was called The One-Year Book of Family Devotions. 
And for every day, there was uh, some scripture reading and a little story that went along with it. Well, when Tori came down into the kitchen, my wife wanting to say, listen, I was totally serious about praying about this thing. I wasn't just trying to put you off or, and, you know, just give you some pat answer. But she said, I just want to remind you, let's just keep praying about that list. Let's believe God because he knows best, all right? So she opens up the devotional, November 1st, and the title of the devotional is God Knows Best. And so my wife goes, oh, I like this already. And Tori's like, what? You know, and so they read the story, and the story is about a family who is planting a church in another community, and they're leaving their church, and the boy, the son in the story, doesn't want to go. My daughter's like, that's not true. You're making it up. Give me that book, you know. They're fighting over the book, you know. But it was true. It was, that's what it was. And, you know, I come walking into the kitchen, and uh, Nadine's dancing in the kitchen. God is speaking to Tori. I know you're impressed with my dance moves now, too. You're not going to be able to forget that. But uh, that's probably the best part of the sermon, isn't it? She was dancing around. My daughter was, like, freaked out. She's nine years old. She can't believe that God had spoken that clearly, you know, to her in that moment. And I tell you that story because there are some of you, you've got a whole list of reasons why you're not serving. Some of them are legit. Some work responsibilities, maybe family responsibilities, maybe health issues. But here's what I want you to do. Take that list and do what my wife and daughter did. Just bring it to God. He knows best. In fact, Peter is reminding us in our text that in light of Christ's return, we must live our lives in service to one another to serve and use what God has given us. We have to steward what God has given us for his glory, for his honor, so that in the end, right, everything in everything, God would be glorified through Jesus Christ. So take that list and bring it to him and say, Lord, I don't know how all these details are going to work out, but you've given me some gifts. You've given me grace. I want to use it for you. And so we're going to pray in a few moments. And we're going to do what we do all the time here at Cornerstone. We give you an opportunity if you're here, maybe for the first time, or you're watching online for the first time. And you're saying, you know, you've never given your life to Christ. I want to give you an opportunity. We haven't preached sort of an evangelistic thing here this morning. But, but God has been at work in your life, maybe drawing you to this moment. You're not here by accident. And so if that's you and you're ready to take that step, you're just saying, you know, what I hear rings true and I'm ready to give my life to Christ, to ask him to forgive me, to come into my life, to turn my life over to him. We want to give you an opportunity to do that today. And so when I close in prayer, I'm going to invite you to pray. I'll pray out loud. You pray in your heart. You surrender in that moment to him. I want to pray for those of you who may have the, that list. You're ready. You're saying, yeah, I'm bringing you the list, Lord. I'm giving you the list and uh, I'm ready to... Step up. And maybe you haven't been serving because you've been disobedient. It's a moment to settle it with God and get it right with him. And then the last thing I'm going to do is pray over the offering. Right? We've got to take an offering. Where two or three are gathered together, take up an offering. I thought that was pretty funny too. <laughs> We're going to pray over the offering, give you an opportunity to give. Again, there's a number of ways that you can give here at Cornerstone Church. We have our our app, the Push Pay app, you can give that way. You can text your giving. There are going to be things up on the screen there eventually for you to see all of this. You can, you can text. You can use the Push Pay app. You can give online. Or you can use the envelope that's located in your seat and then uh, place those in the uh, offering boxes as you're uh, exiting today. So we're going to pray for all those things at, at one moment and just ask God to do his work in our hearts. Would you pray with me? Father, today we, again, thank you for your goodness and grace. Always, Lord, your love that you give to us so freely, a love that we don't deserve. Thank you for it. Lord, as we come in this moment, perhaps there are some today, here or online, Lord, who are ready to take that step of faith and surrender to you. 
They're asking in this moment for you to come into their lives and to forgive them. And Lord, I ask now that as they take that step and as they just express that in the simplest way, that Lord, you would meet them in a moment, that you would pour out your love. Lord, that you would pour out your grace and may they just experience forgiveness and freedom from being forgiven. And Lord, come into their life. Make them new as you do. Lord, for those who are who've been on the sideline, who've been on the bench and out of the game, Lord, today I pray that uh, you will work in their hearts to help them to step forward, to use the grace and the gifts that you've put in them to bring you glory, that they would do that. Lord, for those who've been disobedient, who, who have been out of the game because, Lord, they're just focused on themselves or whatever it might be, you know, Lord, we pray this morning that they will turn to you for forgiveness. Lord, once again, surrender themselves to you so that they can live the life that you've designed for them. And Father, we pray over the offering even now. Lord, as, as we give to you, as we worship you with our giving, our tithes and offerings and missions giving, Lord, take it and use it to glorify you, to spread the gospel around the world, this beautiful gospel to people everywhere here and around the world, we pray. Take it and receive it as our worship to you today. And Lord, we thank you. As we, we go from this place, Lord, may we just take you and all that you've given us to serve you, to serve others in a way that brings you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate it. Glad that you carved out some space to worship God, but uh, you've chosen to do that with us. We're, we're glad that you're here. We hope to see you next week. Uh, have a wonderful week. If you need prayer, we do have members of our prayer team that will be available at the end of the service. If you want to just come and pray here at the altar, you're more than welcome to do that. You can make a little prayer place right in your seat if you'd like, but if you need prayer and want someone to pray with you, uh, there will be some people here available, and uh, we'd be glad to do that. Uh, with you and for you uh, today. So again, thank you for being here. Remember, grow track at one o'clock. God bless you and have a great week.